It is indeed a moment of great pride and honor for us and the city of Kolkata that we have today with us a truly special man. A man of multi-dimensional type, a man of exceptional achievement, and a man of the world of out of the world experience. Professor Claude Collier is with us. So may I request, ladies and gentlemen, to please rise in a standing ovation to our honor guest, Professor Claude Collier. Claude Collier has been for nearly 30 years a European Space Agency astronaut of Swiss nationality. He is the first Swiss astronaut, actually. He graduated from the University of Lausanne in 1970 in physics and the University of Geneva in 1975, Master of Science in Astrophysics. He also graduated as a Swiss Air Force pilot in 1966 and airline pilot in 1974 and flew DC-9 for Swiss Air and a test pilot in 1988. He was a member of the first group of ESA astronauts selected in 1978. He joined Group 9 of NASA astronauts in 1980 for space shuttle training at the Johnson Space Center, Houston, Texas, where he has been stationed until September 2005. His technical assignments in Houston have included space shuttle flight software verification in the shuttle avionics integration laboratory, development of tethered satellite system retrieval techniques, remote manipulator system, and international space station robotic support. From 1996 to 1998, he was head of the astronaut office robotics branch. From 2000 onwards, he was a member of the astronaut office extravehicular activity branch while maintaining a position as lead ESA astronaut in Houston. During his assignment in the rank of captain, flying on Hawker Hunter and Pilatus PC-9 aircraft until the end of 2004, he has logged more than 6,000 flight hours, 3,500 of which is in jet aircraft. He retired from the European Space Agency on March 31, 2007 and is currently professor at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Luzon where he teaches a course on space technology and operations and provides assistance to students on various space related projects. From the spring semester of 2009, this course is also transmitted to students at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. He is also involved in the solar impulse, solar powered aircraft program as head of flight test operations. This project was launched by Barton Picker and has an objective to fly around the world in several lakes on solar power only, with one pilot on board. Now, the most important, he has been a crew member on four space shuttle flights. I'll give you a brief details of those flights. STS-46 Atlantis in 1992, launched from the Kennedy Space Center, Florida, was an eight-day mission during which crew members deployed the European Retrievable Carrier Science Platform and conducted the first tethered satellite system test flight. Mission was accomplished in 126 orbits of the Earth and after traveling 3.35 million miles in 191 hours, 16 minutes and 7 seconds. STS-61 Endeavour in 1993 was the first Hubble Space Telescope servicing a return mission. During the 11th flight, the HST was captured and restored to full capacity to a record five space walks by four astronauts after having traveled 4433772 miles in 163 orbits of the Earth in 259 hours 59 minutes. STS 75 Columbia in 1996 was a 15 day flight, with principal payloads being the reflight of the tethered satellite system and the third flight of the United States microgravity payload. The TSS successfully demonstrated the ability of feathers to produce electricity. STS-103 discovery in 1999 was an eight-day mission during which the crew successfully installed new instruments 
and upgraded systems on the Hubble Space Telescope. Enhancing HST scientific capabilities required three spacewalks. Total in 24 hours, 33 minutes of which Professor Claude did take a spacewalk. The STS-103 mission was accomplished in 120 hour orbits, traveling 3.2 million miles in 191 hours and 11 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Claude Ecuador. Let us listen to the man himself. So I invite Professor Claude Nicolier, the stage is yours, Claude. Well, good afternoon, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here at the VLA Industrial and Technological Museum in Kolkata. And uh, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Dr. Vertela, the Director General of all the Science Museums here in India, uh, Dr. Islam, the Director of this Museum in Kolkata, and uh, thank you very much for his uh, kind introduction also. In fact, I, I think I would summarize um, my CV curriculum vitae in the following way. In fact, I was very lucky, very, very lucky, and uh, I'm a civil servant who did his job. This is the way I would summarize my, my, my curriculum vitae. <clears throat> but I was really lucky. Uh, I know a lot of my colleagues from uh, the aviation world as pilots or uh, scientists who could have become astronauts, but uh, they did not have the luck to come at the right moment at the right time. And it didn't happen for them, and it did happen for me, and I was really, really very lucky. I would like to thank uh, also the representative of the Swiss uh, Embassy in Delhi, uh, Matja Celio, who is responsible for the uh, science uh, sector. <coughs> Uh, and uh, who really was instrumental in getting me to come here to uh, India uh, for this talk. And I would like to thank finally all of you uh, students and uh, teachers also in, this, uh, in the schools in the Kolkata and Tarani for coming here and demonstrating your interest for uh, space science and technology. I come here really as an astronaut, true, but I come also as a friend. You should consider myself as a friend who wants to communicate with you and hopefully we'll be able to establish cooperation between Switzerland and India in the future uh, in the field of uh, uh, space activities. As you know, there was a, this treaty of friendship between uh, India and Switzerland, which was uh, signed in 1948, and we had a 60-year celebration last year. And this year is the year of science and education in India Switzerland. Um, and uh, there has been already, as this was mentioned before, cooperation between India and Switzerland to begin the launch of that uh, Swiss Cube satellite, a small student satellite, just about as big as my hand here on my, on my left hand, uh, one liter volume and uh, less than one kilogram weight that will be launched on the uh, Indian launch in two weeks from now. This is a form of collaboration, and I think it's only the start of a collaboration between India and Switzerland uh, for space activities. Whether it's at the professional level for big satellites or big spaceships or exploration of uh, other worlds in the solar system, or the development and build up of a small satellite by students, which has uh, incredible educational value. Okay, let's start with, uh, with this presentation here. Uh, this first slide is, I, I like it, I like this, uh, this artist view of a space world. You have the Earth with the uh, city lights, and uh, you have the moon at a certain distance, uh, hiding part of the sun, you have the Milky Way in the background. And I think uh, it's a nice artist view that expresses the, uh, the dream of uh, a space exploration. And, Space travel has always been associated with the realization of humanity's widest dreams. Uh, of course, it's work, it's science and technology, but it's also the real realization of dreams. And uh, this presentation, I named it uh, Journeys into Space, and I won't talk only about my journey, but about journeys of humanity uh, into space. I like this uh, picture that you have here, because this is a space shuttle on orbit around the Earth, and uh, it's a beautiful picture taken from the International Space Station, to which the space shuttle was docked already. And uh, you see here the, the cockpit of the space shuttle, the open payload bay doors, the nose of the space shuttle with all the small rocket engines, allowing a change of the attitude, not attitude, but attitude or orientation of the shuttle. In the background, you always have this magnificent view of the Earth. This is the Pacific Ocean. 
with this line here, which is the dividing line between day on the earth and night on the earth, and always the completely black background of the sky, which is which is beautiful. So already this first time picture expresses some of the magic of a space flight. As you know, space flights in general started in the 60s, excuse me, the 50s, with the launch of Sputnik 1 in 1957, and human space flight started in 1961. This was during a period of Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. There was definitely huge competition between these two nations uh, in the steps of uh, achieving uh, results in their space exploration. As you know, the first steps were successfully accomplished by the Soviet Union. And the first uh, satellite, Sputnik 1, the first uh, human, no, the, the first living creature in, in space, which was a little dog named Laika on the Sputnik 2, a few months after Sputnik 1 only. Um, the first uh, man in space, Yuri Gagarin, in uh, April 1961, the first woman in space, the first space war. These were all successful in the Soviet Union. But the response to the United States was absolutely fantastic. This is the Apollo program. And uh, it was launched at the beginning of the 60s by President Kennedy, who made that famous speech, uh, you know, we. We want to go to the moon before the end uh, of the decade of the 60s, and uh, we do it because it is hard, not because it is easy. Uh, the fact that it is hard will allow us to focus the energies and the talents of the nation in order to accomplish something really, really very difficult and very valuable. And uh, the program was, was a huge success, the Apollo program. Uh, and for me, it still is a... Is a incredible achievements of a large group of people in the United States. There was, of course, money for that program because it was important for the United States to successfully accomplish it. But it was a masterfully accomplished uh, program and uh, brought back absolutely spectacular pictures and results. And look at this picture of the Earth, as the astronauts were going uh, between the Earth vicinity and the Moon after the TLI burn, as you may remember some of you trans and translunar injection burn, leaving uh, the orbit around the Earth and going towards the Moon. Uh, magnificent picture of our planet as the astronauts were nearing our satellite. And uh, then, as you know, they were coming on orbit around the Moon uh, with the lunar module attached to the service module. Uh, and we had also amazing pictures of uh, the rise of planet Earth at the arrival of the Moon, as the, the double spaceship was circling the Moon. Then there was separation of the lunar module from the service module, and two astronauts were coming down, landing on the surface of the Moon. And as you know, we celebrated a few weeks ago the 40th anniversary of the Apollo 11 uh, landing uh, on the Moon, um, which is, uh, of course, uh, an absolutely remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, not only by the two astronauts who did that, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin, but also the whole team that uh, uh, made it possible, including the ground control team uh, in Houston. Uh, as you know, several uh, Apollo missions followed that, including Apollo uh, 16, which you see here. This is the, the, the mission before last of the Apollo series in 1972. And at that time, they were using a small rover that allowed them to explore a larger area around the landing point of the lunar module. And this is astronaut John Young, an American, uh, who was in fact the last of the Apollo astronauts to stay within the NASA astronaut corps. Uh, when I was in Houston between 1980 and 19, uh, 2005, uh, for many, many years, John Young was still there. He was also the, the first commander of the uh, space shuttle in uh, 1981 and the flew then as a commander of the space shuttle on the science mission, the space shuttle one mission. So really a remarkable uh, astronaut, and uh, he flew Gemini, Gemini two times, he flew on the moon on Apollo 16, he was the commander of the, the first shuttle flight and on the subsequent flight also. So a very, very wide experience of space flight. Very, very respected man. This is John Young. And you see he had fallen on the surface of the moon because there is moon dust on the surface of his, uh, his space suit. So this was probably the brightest chapter of uh, exploration of space by humans, the Apollo program. And personally, I have a huge, huge respect for what was accomplished in the 60s and early 70s in that program. Now, after the end of this program in 1972, 
in December 1972 or 2017, all of the flights of human beings in space were on low Earth orbit. When I say low Earth orbit, I mean a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface. And the, uh, this is very, very close to the surface of the Earth. So the, the atmosphere is very thin. And uh, if you are two or three or four hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface, you can be on orbit. You still have a little bit of atmosphere, but so little that you can stay on orbit a very long time. And this is typically what you see at the Earth when you are on low Earth orbit, a few hundred kilometers above the Earth's surface. Completely black sky, I mentioned that already, you have the sun like a star in the sky. I say like a star because it's surrounded by, by blackness, like uh, the star that we see during the night. And it really looks when you're in space uh, that the sun is a star, which we know of course, because we read it in books, and we know that it's a similar object. Uh, but when you're in space, you realize uh, that the sun is a star, because it looks like a star, it's not a very close black like star. Now, you look, if you look at the Earth, this is a very thin atmosphere, very, very thin, and always impressive to see how thin the atmospheric layer is around our planet. And of course, you see these clouds, as you know, the maximum height of clouds is about 10 to 13 kilometers, and at 300 or 400 kilometers, we are, of course, much higher than that. But it's beautiful view. I was never, never tired of looking at the Earth uh, from lower Earth orbit. Now this is an interesting view of the Earth because it's centered on a very important country which is India. You have very few views of the Earth that are centered on India. Most of them are centered on the United States or yeah, Europe, but uh, um, here we give value to the Indian uh, subcontinent where there is a rising effort to do space exploration with remarkable results already in the Indian space program uh, with the Indian Space Research Organization uh, conducting this program in a very very talented man. And there are many questions about the Earth, life, our origins, and future. Questions also about whether we are alone as a, um, as a living creatures in the universe or not. And many of these questions uh, have not yet found an answer, but uh, space exploration is a good means to find answers to these big questions about the origin of the Earth, origin of life and about whether we are alone in the universe or not, as a living creature. And uh, of course, in order to do this uh, research on low Earth orbit, uh, you need a spaceship. And uh, in the United States, the space shuttle was developed in the 70s and operated from the, 19, from the early 1980s on. The first flight was on the 12th of April 1981, which was exactly 20 years after the flight of Gagarin, by the way. This picture of the space shuttle on the uh, on its way to the launch pad, which you see here, was taken recently. It's a very, very interesting picture because there was obviously a thunderstorm in the vicinity. And it was published on the website of NASA uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's a very, very nice picture of the space shuttle. So in the US, after the end of the Apollo program and the, the Skylab program that followed a few years later, uh, there was a development of a reusable spaceship to reach low Earth orbit. I say reusable because this space shuttle is reusable, it's used over and over again, as opposed to rockets used in the past which were lost at every launch. This is the launch of the space shuttle. You have um, two solid rocket motors that provide the largest fraction of the thrust for the vertical launch about 1,000 tons of thrust for each of the solid rocket boosters. And in addition, you have three hydrogen engines which are using the content of this big external tank, which contains initially 700 tons of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen uh, to reach space in only about eight and a half minutes. It's really interesting to see that space is very near. You reach space in only eight and a half minutes. After two minutes, the two boosters are separated uh, from the tank, and then uh, only the orbiter containing the payload and the crew, seven people in the front cabin here, and the big tank continue to travel to uh, the so-called main engine cutoff point, uh, eight and a half minutes after liftoff, where you are already on orbit. So it's a very, very, very short trip to orbit. Very dynamic, but very short in time. Okay, I have a short video clip here, we don't have the sound here installed, but I'm going to show you a short video clip of uh, the first two minutes of the ascent. Uh, no, we don't have it here. Sorry. 
Yeah. Okay, the video clip is here. Um, it will show you the launch of the space shuttle and seal the solid rocket booster separation. First, we have the uh, engine start of the hydrogen engine, and our computer is verifying that everything is okay with these three hydrogen engines. Then, at time t zero, we have the two solid boosters that are ignited and uh, up to go to the vertical with a lot of noise, yeah. huge flames in the background. And a relatively small acceleration of a lot of vibration you see in the cabin here, uh, but only an acceleration of about one and a half G. And then you have a roll maneuver, you see the sun rising over the Atlantic Ocean, you see the Atlantic coast uh, moving rapidly under us, and the space shuttle has started. It, it's relatively short travel of only eight and a half minutes to roll at all. This is from a camera on the tank, you see the coast of Freud in the background. Uh, this is probably about uh, one and a half minutes after liftoff. Uh, the shuttle has taken the direction of its uh, orbit toward the east or the northeast. And in a few seconds, you are going to see the separation of the two solid rocket boosters. Again, two minutes after liftoff. Uh, but you see the sky is already completely black. After two minutes, you are at about 30 kilometers or 35 kilometers altitude. The sky is already completely black because the atmosphere is so thin. The boosters fall down on the ocean and are reused on later flights. Then you continue going up for six and a half extra minutes, and then you're on orbit. And it's an absolutely, absolutely incredible environment when you are there. And uh, once you have the main engine cut off, uh, you are going to leave this very noisy environment of the ascent to a completely quiet, quiet environment. You don't need any more engines once you're on orbit. It's like the moon. The moon doesn't need any orbit to stay on it, doesn't need any engine to stay on its orbit around the Earth. Same thing for the space shuttle. And here we are, again the Earth, the Terminator, limit between night and day on the surface of the Earth, the sun like a star, the completely black background. And this is the payload bay of the shuttle. We have opened the payload bay doors of the shuttle. We have the robotic arm that has been partly deployed, ready to capture uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. This is taken on the Hubble space telescope service mission. But it's really a magic environment. Imagine moving around the Earth at uh, 28,000 kilometers an hour, or eight kilometers per second, or five miles per second, or one revolution around the Earth in an hour and a half, or 16 times around the Earth in a terrestrial day, and all of this in silence. And this is unusual because here on, on Earth, we associate high speed with a lot of noise, like a sports car or a jet fighter. I mean, they move fast, but they are very noisy. And here you are, they're high above the Earth's atmosphere. You are moving very fast and with no noise. Magic. This is a picture of the space shuttle on orbit taken from the International Space Station, to which it was at the dark a few minutes later. And uh, you see the payload bay doors are open, and you have the feeling this is an airplane flying over uh, a landscape here on the Earth, and it's not so, of course, they are much higher than the atmosphere. You see the clouds are much, 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 much below us. Uh, payload bay doors have been open, you see the robotic arms that have been partly deployed, and uh, <coughs> opening the payload bay doors exposing of course, the content of the payload bay to the space environment. And also you have cooling through uh, radiators which you have inside the doors here. There's a lot of heat generated by the avionics on board the space shuttle. And uh, this heat is transmitted to a freon flow which flows inside small tubes in the payload bay doors and is radiated back into space. Now, obviously, when you are on orbit around uh, the Earth in the, in the space shuttle, you are in awakenness. There's no more gravity. And the reason is not, like some people believe, because we are far away from the Earth. The reason is because we are in free fall. Uh, and I would like you to try to understand that. You have zero gravity or awakenness when you are in free fall. You have the same if you are in an elevator here on Earth and the, the, the cable breaks. They're going to be in free fall in the elevator cage for a few seconds, and they're going to have weightlessness in the elevator. So weightlessness does not come from the fact that we are far, far away from the Earth when we are in space, but it comes from the fact that we are in free fall. Here we are in free fall, 
Um, but not radically, we are in free fall. Radically, we will hit the ground after a few minutes. We are in free fall uh, with a horizontal component of the velocity, and because there is curvature of the Earth, we never really hit the ground. This is the way you can understand the orbit. Uh, this is inside the cabin. This picture was taken on my first space flight. I don't remember who, who we had here. I know, it, I know exactly my other six fellow crew members on this mission, but uh, I can't recognize them here. And they were observing the Earth through the front window during the orbital night, because you see here through the front window, it's completely dark at this night. And there's another interesting feature. If you look at all of those, it's very complicated cockpit. These are the terminals of the onboard computers with the keyboard here. And if you look at the switches here, they are all guarded. They are all surrounded by two metal loops. And the reason is the following. If you look at this picture, of it, their feet, the astronauts would change the position of some switches inadvertently. And some of these switches are very critical, like the computer switches which we have here, five of them. You don't want to turn the computers off with your feet so <laughs> when you're in such a position. So, all these uh, switches are guarded, and these are the characteristics of a uh, human spaceship. Food, uh, we eat relatively normal food that we carry in dehydrated form, uh, which means we have removed the water out of the food, uh, which allows us to store it for several days or several weeks, even without uh, refrigeration. We don't have the refrigerator on board, so the, the food conserves itself quite well being uh, dehydrated or with the water removed. And of course, we have to add water before we consume it. And here, we have three containers of a uh, scrambled egg, which before rehydration uh, was like yellow powder in plastic uh, bags. But after rehydration, it, it's really like scrambled eggs, when it tastes like scrambled eggs, and uh, it has a consistency scrambled egg, it's quite good. Um, so again, the food on board the space shuttle is taken in dehydrated form in order for it not to spoil. And it takes also less volume and less mass to take it in this form. Um, the electrical power on board the space shuttle is not generated by solar rays or solar sails, but by fuel cells that combine oxygen, hydrogen with a catalyzer and produce electrical power. We have three such fuel cells, each delivering about 7 kilowatts of, elect of electrical uh, power. So the grand total of 20 kilowatts, uh, and producing about 100 liters of um, water per day as a byproduct. And some of this water we can use to rehydrate the food. Now there is a lighter form of food which you see here. This is my commander on my first flight in the summer of 1992, Lawrence Fryer, who is consuming M&Ms. These are sugar-coated uh, small uh, chocolates, and they are slowly moving. Uh, from his open hand to his mouth. It's a nice photo. You can see the background is characteristics of space, which I mentioned already before, the black sky and uh, the ocean with the blue and white colors. Now, when we have a little bit of free time on board the space and of course, every mission has a certain objective. We try to accomplish that certain goals, uh, technical and scientific goals, obviously. Uh, but we have sometimes uh, an hour or two of free time, not very often, but sometimes we do. And of course, most of the free time is spent looking out the window, because it's such a spectacular view, but also sometimes we play with fluids. And you see here, a uh, big ball of uh, water, not the bubble, but it's a ball of water, uh, that is just floating free. And uh, as you know, the fluids in the absence of gravity take their spherical uh, shape. The, the sphere is the uh, shape that gives you the smallest possible surface for a given volume. And as you have surface tension on the surface of uh, uh, any free liquid, uh, you have kind of a skin around that uh, volume of liquid that uh, has tension, and it tries to minimize the surface for a given volume that gives you a sphere. And it's really fun to, to, to play with these spheres of fluid. If you blow on them, you can, uh, they are come. So I can move slowly in the opposite direction of the blow, and it generates also oscillations inside these uh, volumes of fluid, which are very tiny to explain. Now, <clears throat> we need to sleep also sometimes, and um, the flight plan is divided in slices of 24 hours. In, in one such slice of 24 hours, we sleep for about seven hours, pretty much like here on Earth. And uh, when it's time to go, and uh, sleep, we take our sleeping bags and install it either on the floor 
it is really too conventional. It's uh, more fun to install the sleeping bag on the side wall or the ceiling. Why not? You can do that. And then we sleep during these about uh, seven hours. Then we're woken up by uh, wake up music from the ground. And then we start again our working day for about 12 hours. And then again, the, after a short period in between the work time and the sleep time, the sleep time is seven hours. And it continues until the end of the mission. And uh, when I say end of mission, typically special mission duration is uh, 10 to 12 days maximum. Uh, never more than about 15 days. After that, you run out of uh, oxygen and an electrical power on board the ship. Now the mission ends with a landing, of course. It's a year uh, landing on the 5 kilometer long runway at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. And in the background, you see the uh, launch complex ready to accommodate the space shuttle for the next mission two or three months later. So it's a reusable spacecraft, and that's really the novelty of the space shuttle, is reused over and over again, as opposed to rockets in the past. Now sometimes we need to land not at the Kennedy Space Center, which is a launch site also, but at another location like uh, Edwards Air Force Base in California, which is a desert. So the weather is always, or nearly always, good at Edwards. Because very often you have thunderstorms or fog at the Kennedy Space Center. So NASA has had to find a way to carry the space shuttle from uh, Edwards to Florida, and it uses a Boeing 747, specially equipped to carry the space shuttle from uh, the west coast of the United States to the east coast. <coughs> Now, the main destination of the Space Shuttle seems seven years, and uh, it will continue being so for about a year and a half or so, is the International Space Station. When you see ISS for International Space Station, this is a very large complex of laboratories which uh, is uh, managed and uh, built and operated by 16 nations, the United States, Russia, Canada, and Japan, and 12 member states of the European Space Agency, including Switzerland. And uh, the, the build up of the space station started about 10 years ago, um, which was 1998, end of 1998. And this is the current status of the huge laboratory uh, with uh, American components here, there are Russian modules, uh, European lab here, a Japanese lab. And this large sidebar was was procured by uh, the U.S. partner uh, together with a huge solar array at the end of this time zone. So this is a large laboratory complex available for astronauts and scientists of all the participating nations to do space exploration. It's on a 350 kilometers uh, altitude orbit, 51 degree inclination. And the inclination is an important factor in an orbit for a human uh, spacecraft because it will determine what you will see of the Earth. If you have an equatorial orbit, you're always over the equator. If you have a polar orbit with a 90 degree inclination versus the equator for the orbital plane, then of course after a while you will see all of the surface of the Earth, because the Earth will rotate under your orbit, which orbit remains pretty much uh, fixed with respect to inertial space. It has a small rotation because of precession, the Earth not being completely circular but a little bit flattened. But basically, the Earth is rotating under your orbit. So the higher the inclination, uh, of course, the wider or the larger portion of the surface of the Earth you will be able to see. And the 51 degree is pretty large inclination. Basically, astronauts on board the space station can see everything on the Earth after a while between 51 degree northern latitude and 51 degree southern latitude. And uh, <clears throat> of course, a lot of the effort until now has been to build up the space station. They have been relatively little used for science, but uh, the use for science will start uh, pretty much now. We have six people permanently on board the space station, and uh, the assembly is nearly completed, so we'll be able, for about 10 years, to exploit the station as a scientific laboratory in space. And uh, these are the six people who are currently on board the station now, and uh, it's interesting to see the mix of nationalities that you have. This is American, Mike Barrett. This is uh, Koichi Wakata from uh, the Japanese Space Agency. The Russians, Russian, 
This is uh, Frank Devine from Belgium representing the European Space Agency. And uh, this is Bob Perth representing the Canadian Space Agency. So uh, you have astronauts of various nationalities, of various cultures, various languages, although the language officially is English, uh, operating simultaneously on board the International Space Station. And eating together, you see, you are eating here. The very food preparations are pretty floating here at the can. But some food floating in between. See here, 28,000 kilometers an hour. That's the speed limit. You don't want to go faster. If you go faster, you'll go, uh, you leave your circular orbit and go on an elliptical orbit, which is undesirable. Okay, <clears throat> this was um, basically space travel, human space travel in general. I'll say a few words about my own experience. Uh, I was involved specifically in uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, project, and I'll say a few words about that, especially as uh, I know in this museum there's quite a lot of emphasis on astronomy because this is a year of astronomy. Um, and I had the privilege out of my four space flights to twice go to the Hubble Space Telescope to do repair work and uh, maintenance work and improvement uh, of the capability of the, of the telescope. Basically, the project is the following you have a telescope with a 2.4 meter diameter primary mirror, so the reflecting telescope, on low Earth orbits, basically at 600 kilometers altitude. And uh, it's, it's tele operated from the ground, so the ground control, uh, at the Goddard Space Flight Center and the Greenbelt, Maryland, near Washington. And uh, it's being pointed to such objects, and then you activate such cameras through such filters in order to record the scientific data. And then the scientific results are beamed down to the ground via a relay satellite on geosynchronous orbit. Uh, so it's quite a complex operation. Uh, first of all, you need it to install the telescope on orbit and operate it. But then, in order to use it scientifically, it's quite a complex operation, which is the responsibility of the US partner. It's a joint program of uh, NASA and the European Space Agency. And uh, <clears throat> of course, it has a perfect view of the celestial object that is preserving because it is in space. You have nothing in between the telescope and between the object that you observe, as opposed to telescopes on the surface of the Earth which see the celestial object through the atmosphere. And you know the atmosphere is filtering a lot of the radiation, all of the ultraviolet is filtered, the good part of the infrared, the gamma rays, X rays are filtered. So you have a perfect view of the universe, and also in the visible part of the spectrum, the pictures are much better because you don't have the atmospheric turbulence, which is limiting the resolution of a ground-based telescope. But of course, it's a complex instrument. It did cost quite a lot, about $2 billion, expensive telescope. Um, this is the instrument part in the back of the primary mirror, where you have several cameras and uh, spectrometers and uh, uh, analyzing the picture form in the back of the primary mirror. As you know, when you have a reflecting telescope, in the primary mirror, uh, transforming the pattern beam coming from the celestial object to a converging beam for the, for the secondary mirror, then we have another converging beam that is formed the focus in the back of the primary mirror. That's where the picture is formed, analyzed by these various instruments. Now, the telescope was launched in 1990 uh, with the Space Shuttle, and unfortunately it was suffering from uh, one flaw, which is an optical flaw. Uh, it didn't have really a good vision because of a slightly uh, wrong shape of the primary mirror. So it was necessary to go and intervene directly on orbit in order to install an optical corrector. We also had problems with the solar arrays. And uh, the plan was anyway, the, uh, Hubble Space Telescope project to go and visit it every three or four years to do either repairs if needed or improvements uh, if improvements were deemed necessary, mainly in the area of the instrumentation. And uh, I was privileged to be selected uh, for the first servicing mission of Hubble, which was planned for the end of 1993, so three and a half years after its launch to orbit. And we immediately uh, started training for about one year from the end of 1992 to end of 1993. And we used primarily a big water tank as a drop of space center with a high field energy model of the telescope itself, which you see here, including doors, which gave us access to the inside of the telescope. We could go inside and we had in the water precise 
location of all the instrumentation. So we have a really, really high fidelity model. And there was a high fidelity model of the payload bay of the shuttle, of the robot arm, which we were going to use, and also the airlock was very uh, high fidelity uh, represented uh, in the water. So we trained there for about one year. Of course, we had a lot of training outside of the water also, but the water training was very important because it could uh, expose us to the challenge of doing the repair work in the absence of gravity, which is simulated by the water environment. You know, we put uh, enough uh, <coughs> weight and uh, address the buoyancy of each astronaut, there are two of them here, uh, so that they are completely neutrally buoyant inside the water. And not only globally neutrally buoyant, but each of the limbs is neutrally buoyant. You don't have one leg that tends to go up and one arm that tends to go down. And, uh, everything is neutrally buoyant. You are really liking weight uh, One difference is, of course, you can swim in the water, you can't swim in space. So, uh, everything we're doing was always a very slow motion, so the viscosity of the water was not really a factor. But we could really experience uh, the challenge of uh, being stabilized in order to do any useful work. For instance, if you want to uh, undo a tight bowl with a power tool, if you don't stabilize yourself in the water or in space, you're going to be rotating around the bowl, which is not really useful. It could be fun, but not useful. So these are techniques and strategies that we learn to, uh, in the water before we exercise them in the space environment. Very, very, very valuable training to the big water company. Well, this is D-Day, uh, launch day for this first visit of the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, that was the uh, uh, 2nd of December, 1993. Uh, we were taken with a little bus from uh, crew quarters at the Kennedy Space Center, the seven of us, there were seven astronauts, including myself, uh, to the launch pad, and then uh, it took about two o'clock in the morning, in the middle of the night, on a relatively cold winter night, and then you open the door of the little bus, and that's what you see. It's really impressive. Really impressive. That's your spaceship that will take you into space in a couple of hours from the time you, you arrive there. Uh, these are moments that I personally would never forget, when, when you see close by your, your spaceship. Then you go up on an elevator to this level, the seven of us, we cross on a bridge to the so-called white room here, um, where the last preparations are made before getting into the cabin, which is here. The payload bay of the sun was filled with instruments that were going to be trained on the uh, telescope, including the optical corrector, which I mentioned, and two new solar rays on. Really impressive moment. The lift took place at 4.26 in the morning, so a night launch, really impressive to do a night launch because it's suddenly a uh, night that becomes day because of the brightness permitted by the uh, solid rocket boosted exhaust. And we needed to lift off on time because imagine if you lift off with the intention of making a rendezvous with the orbiting spacecraft, you need to lift off when the launch site is in the plane of the orbit of the target. And uh, you can imagine that uh, you have the orbit of the target like this, pretty much fixed with respect to inertial space. The Earth is rotating under this orbit. And then, uh, in our case, once per day, we had uh, the launch site which was in the plane of the orbit of the target. It just happened that the orbit of Hubble was 28 and a half degree inclination to the latitude of Kennedy Space Center. So once per day, we had uh, this situation, and we needed to lift off at 4.26 in the morning. Which happened, was fine. Then we performed a rendezvous with Hubble, and not by chance, but following very precise maneuvers, we found Hubble in, this, in, in its orbit. Over the Indian Ocean, you see here Hubble about 100 meters away from us. We are approaching it very slowly at only a few centimeters per second at that distance. You see the robot arm of the shuttle ready for the capture of the telescope, which is one of my responsibilities. And uh, this is really impressive because you have a spacecraft moving at uh, 28 kilometers, 28,000 kilometers an hour. You are yourself moving at 28,000 kilometers an hour, and you are slowly approaching formation flight with this object in order to capture it and uh, and uh, make it to your your spaceship. Uh, we had practiced that in the simulator a lot, so I was confident we could do it. So the commander 
flew manually the space shuttle in close vicinity to the telescope with a proper relative orientation, then it was formulated relatively easy with a robot arm to capture the telescope and install it in Taylor Bay, which I had done here, uh, on a small platform in the back of the Taylor Bay. It was a rotating platform which could allow us to orient toward the front of the Taylor Bay, the area of the telescope we had to do an intervention in the following day. You see the solar arrays, which were not in very good shape. In fact, they were uh, slightly damaged by the space environment and had to be exchanged. That's the end of the robot arm, which had been used to capture the telescope and employ it. And this was a big instrument, about 15 meters high, four and a half meter diameter in, in, in the bottom. And in the background, you have the island of uh, Madagascar, the Indian Ocean on the left hand side. Now, the plan was for us to capture the telescope on one day, two days after the talk, and then uh, in the following five days to form five spacewalks according to a very precise program which we had practiced in the water in order to do this repair work on Hubble, in particular the optical correction and the exchange of solar rays. And we always had the 4 scenario. We had one of our spacewalking astronauts on the platform at the end of the robot arm, which I was normally operating, and uh, with an open air uh, toolbox, yeah, all the tools were there. Each of the tools was attached with a small safety pedal, so you don't lose the tool. The uh, astronaut was also attached uh, at this point here uh, with a safety pedal. In case he or she gets loose from the platform, at least we won't lose it completely, or him or her, because of the safety pedal, he or she can get back to the robot arm. And that was the scenario. High space force each time having one astronaut on the platform at the end of the arm, the other one being a free floater responsible for his uh, motions on the payload bay or on the telescope. 600 kilometers altitude, that was quite high. You see the curvature of the Earth is pronounced. It's somewhat exaggerated with a fish high lens, but still we're pretty high. That's a couple of pictures taken on the fifth spacewalk out of five spacewalks. We had to take the two astronauts together to the top of the telescope to do some uh, uh, repair work on magnetometers on top of the telescope. And uh, a picture was taken from up there of our spaceship. You see the, the robot arm here, this is the elbow of the robot arm, this is the elbow taken from up there. And this is uh, the payload bay of the shuttle, this is the cabin. The commander was on this side, I was on that side, operating the robot arm. And I mentioned the sun as a star in the sky, and you can see very well in this picture what I mean. It's really like a star. <coughs> That's a nice, nice set of pictures. This is again over the Indian Ocean at Sharks Bay on the west coast of Australia. Success after the five space walk, in fact, we, we, we had total success, and it was not obvious. It was really the first time that uh, we had in the past to repair a complex scientific instrument in the space environment using a combination of robotic system uh, and spacewalking uh, means and tools which had been designed specifically for the purpose. So um, after the, all the repair work was done and before we released the telescope, you can still attach to us the back of the payload bay visible through the aft windows of the cockpit. We all gathered here, Big Cabin, the commander, Story Masquerade, Jeff Hoffman, Ken Bowersoff, Tom Aker, Katie Thompson, and myself gathered there for a family picture, and we were really, really, really happy. We had a total success. And I must tell you that uh, we are nearly obsessed with the idea of being successful on the mission. This is our primary objective. I mean, we go there, of course, it's not a fun to do a space, uh, space mission and to do spacewalks in particular, but we are obsessed with the idea of having success. Because we were given a task which is not easy to accomplish, and we want to have success. And uh, we had total success, so there was really happiness in the crew and also on the ground team. I was lucky enough to go back to Hubble about six years later, which is December 1999, and this is the final approach to the telescope. And uh, I remember this moment, I have a feeling, well, this is a good friend that I had not seen for about six, six years, and I see him again. And this time I was one of the spacewalkers. We had three spacewalks planned. This time we had a big problem with attitude control of the telescope. It was not able to maintain its orientation, so it was not able to do any scientific work 
because of gyroscope failures. So we had to re replace six gyroscopes, replace uh, the onboard computer, which also had problems, and uh, one of the fine guiding sensors in three spacewalks. And here we are, again the same scenario, the telescope is attached to us on that small platform. Uh, that's a robot arm that has brought two astronauts that open the uh, doors of the instrument part of the telescope to gain access to the gyroscope module, so they explain all three gyroscope modules. Uh, the second spacewalk is in preparation now, I'm here in the cabin with all the tools that we were preparing for that spacewalk, that's my spacesuit. This is uh, um, uh, my colleague's uh, spacesuit, my phone's uh, spacesuit. And uh, we're getting ready for the second spacewalk with the objective of exchanging the main computer of Hubble, which is like brain surgery in a way, and uh, exchanging also one of the fine guiding sensors, which was taking pictures at the periphery of the field that was being studied by Hubble in order to record the, on the CCD on the focus of the camera, uh, images of stars, <coughs> and uh, doing everything to maintain the heat of the stars always at the same plane, at the same point on the, on the picture of the, of the fine guidance sensor. And we have three fine guidance sensors. Imagine you have three stars outside of the field of interest, which you're always making in the same position um, on the focus of that camera. Uh, of course, in this case, you're making very precisely an attitude of the telescope. In fact, the telescope is able to maintain an attitude with an accuracy of seven thousandths of an arc second. Seven thousandths of an arc second, which is really remarkable. Well, it's and here we are becoming spacewalkers. It's a very desirable job, and I recommend it very highly. Uh, <laughs> on the basis of my experience, I have a few recommendations to give you. If you are claustrophobic, uh, choose another job. Because when you are inside the space suit uh, and you suffer from claustrophobia, you are not going to be a happy person. So uh, don't do it if you are claustrophobic. Stabilize your body to do any useful work. You can never work when you are free floating in space. Because whatever you will do will always push you, uh, on the average, away from the work, uh, work site. And uh, soon you are going to be too far away to be able to continue working. Within seconds, you're going to be too far away. You always have to be stabilized. And either you have the privilege of being at the end of that uh, robot arm on that platform, being brought by the robotic arm operator at the place of work, or if it's not the case, you need to use one hand to stabilize yourself and work with the other hand, or you need to stabilize your feet, lock your feet somewhere so that you can use both, both hands. But you always need to be stabilized to be able to reduce the work. And I mentioned that already, but I repeat it because it's important. Try not to lose anything, especially astronauts. Because astronauts are really useless when they are lost. <laughs> and uh, lifetime is reduced also to a few hours only. So it's not, not a desirable situation. But also tools. Whenever you use tools, you know, you have a power tool, uh, use it. And then you put it there. And of course, there's no gravity, so it's supposed to stay there, but it does not stay there because there's always some drift. So if you leave it there for a while, it just flows and maybe slowly rotates, and you do something else on the left hand side. When you look here again on the right, it's gone. <laughs> so you need to be sure that you're attaching to the, with the safety tethers. Safety tethers are not only for astronauts, but also for tools or any instrument. Because if you don't attach things, you lose them. And uh, I mentioned that also already, uh, you, you need to work slowly, you have to work slowly in the water and you don't have really the effect of the viscosity of the water, so that's why that's a good training uh, medium. Uh, but we, we work slowly, not only for that reason, we work slowly because if you work too fast, you are going to lose control of your body. Imagine that you translate rapidly along handrails, uh, along one side of the table bay, straight water, and you want to stop. You, you can stop only using the muscles of your wrist. That's all I'm going to be using. And uh, if you move too fast, your muscles of the wrist are not strong enough to be able to stop you. So they're going to continue translating and you're going to lose control. So the experience is uh, we do things always relatively slowly in order not to lose control of uh, the position of our body and the attitude of our body. And that's the best way to reach the objective within a short time. Some views of the Earth, always spectacular views, this is the Sahara Desert. Uh, 
for the fixed rate below the gap. So, if this is a picture that is for me very, very fascinating, it reminds me of a wonderful memory overflight over the whole Himalaya region. We are looking to the west, so in the opposite direction of the direction of our motion. This is Pakistan over there. This is uh, Tibet, Lhasa is around here. Uh, this is northern India. Fine weather, this is not during monsoon time, this is in February season, so this is pretty clear skies over northern India with the Brahmaputra here. Um, as you know, the Brahmaputra starts uh, in uh, Tibet, flows to the east through this narrow gorge and then to the south. It began very wide in the uh, in the north uh, eastern India. We are practically over China or, or north of the uh, no northern boundary of Myanmar and looking to the west. Nepal is about here, Bhutan, Sikkim. Really spectacular view of all of Himalaya. And from Pakistan to China, it only takes about five to six minutes. It's really spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's an unbelievable view to see these huge, huge natural boundaries between uh, uh, Tibet and India in one glimpse. is very, very, very impressive. It's, sometimes it's hard to believe that you have all of Himalaya in front of you, but you do. It's spectacular. Well, this is the mouth of the Ganges into the Bay of Bengal, which is here. Yeah. Part of it is brought over Bangladesh here. Yeah. But we have uh, Kolkata about here. We are here in this museum, I think. Do you agree? You must, I think. Um, it's not a very, very sharp picture. Uh, we don't get a high resolution picture of Kolkata, but this is Kolkata. Kol it's always impressive to see that even large cities like Kolkata are not very visible from space. Uh, you see basically a gray, gray speck. Uh, they are very visible during the night. You during the night, you have lights uh, on in, in the cities. And you, you realize that if you were an extraterrestrial, you would uh, find out that there is life on the surface of the Earth from low Earth orbit at night, yes, but not during the day. Even big cities are not very spectacular from lower Earth orbit during the day, but they are during the night. Mm -hmm. Now, this detailed picture of uh, the, the mouth of Ganges into the Bay of Bengal, you know, this uh, vegetation protected area, and in some part of that mouth of the Ganges into the Bay of Bengal, uh, we recorded with a telephone kind of lens. It's quite, quite, quite a nice picture, really artistic view of a, a feature on the surface of the Earth, which is really interesting and beautiful. A very close picture. Mumbai, it's also not a very high resolution picture, but this is uh, taken from the space shuttle over uh, uh, Mumbai. Now, uh, we also take pictures of uh, uh, unusual events like a volcano, a volcano eruption. This one was taken relatively recently from the International Space Station. It's uh, in the uh, Kamchatka Peninsula, a Sahib Shed volcano. Um, and it's really interesting because the heat generated by this volcano eruption produced the dissipation of the uh, condensation of water or the clouds that dissipated around that point, which in itself is really interesting to see. And uh, the huge and very high cloud of ashes, such as some ashes also that went to the right hand side there, uh, went so high in the atmosphere that it uh, combined with uh, the ice crystal cloud that is forming now on, on top and packing uh, that huge cloud of ash. So it's really, really an interesting view, totally unusual view of a volcanic eruption. Of course, you can imagine from the ground, you could never record such an interesting phenomenon with what is happening at the top of this uh, ash cloud. So these pictures of the Earth are not only sometimes beautiful or interesting, but they bring us a lot of information about unusual phenomena like the uh, production of very high altitude ashes following a volcanic eruption. Sunrise and sunset. If you like those, this is a job to select because uh, we have 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets per terrestrial day. So if you are an aficionado of sunrise and sunset, you need to become an astronaut. <laughs> um, aurora, always beautiful to see from space. Uh, the average amplitude of such or uh, upper boundary of such formation is about uh, 200 kilometers or so. 
that's about 100 kilometers, which is uh, very low if we be measured by this cube. I mentioned that in two minutes from now. Uh, so if you are at 600 kilometers altitude or even 300, you fly over the aurora, so that below you, it's really, really spectacular. I show now a couple of pictures taken by Hubble Space Telescope, very, very high resolution pictures of the celestial object. This is, of course, the Orion Nebula. I'm sure many of you have recognized it. This is a composite picture of this uh, cloud of uh, gas and dust about 7,000 light years away from us in the constellation Orion. And uh, Hubble looked in detail at the central part of the Orion Nebula and detected a number of, this is four out of many more, uh, protostars or stars in the making. They are infant stars, in a way. And uh, they are a concession of interstellar matter, mainly gas and some dust, uh, at the center of which you have an elevated temperature. That's why you have uh, these uh, red cores in these uh, globules of interstellar matter. And of course, further conversation will transform these objects into real stars in a few million or ten million years from now. And they are not only protostars, but they are also protoplanetary disks because they are surrounded by dark matter which probably will transform the planetary system around these uh, stars in the main. Really, really interesting result. And it was only possible due to the very high resolution, spatial resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. A uh, fascinating picture made by Hubble, of course, you don't see as many objects as uh, on the original, but this is a so called Hubble Deep Field, a picture taken by Hubble with a 10-day exposure of an object uh, close to the celestial north pole that is always visible from the orbit of Hubble. Unlike objects close to the celestial equator, which are regularly occulted by the Earth itself. And uh, Hubble patiently accumulated photons coming from this small window in the, in the sky for 10 days and recorded thousands of them. Which is really an interesting result because it shows the richness in galaxies of the universe and also it's a, it's a glimpse in the past of the universe because the faintest galaxies here are about 10 billion light years away, so you see these objects as they were 10 billion years in, in the past. So this is not only a, a view of the depth of the universe but also uh, in the depth of the past of the universe. This is a prime picture extending over billions of years in the, in the history of the universe. Really fascinating picture. And, uh, I think this only picture makes it work for Hubble to have been developed and launched and operated. It's a really wonderful result. And a lot of publications were made on the basis of the Hubble Deep Field, which was taken in 95, and the Hubble Deep Field taken about uh, 10 years later. Two words about the future of human space exploration. Back to the moon in the uh, uh, at the next decade, probably before 2020, that's the objective of NASA. Initially, with the spacecraft, we did it close to what we had on the Apollo program, because it worked fine on Apollo uh, 40 years ago, so uh, NASA wants to be on the safe side and use a similar architecture for the program as they use in the Apollo program. Of course, it's going to be spaceship uh, of the 21st century, much more technologically advanced than the equipment used on Apollo, but the scenario of the mission will be similar. There's a lot of studies of Mars. Uh, we have two rovers on the surface of Mars, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, launched by NASA and operated since nearly three years now on the surface of Mars. And you have one uh, spaceship or probe on orbit around the red planet with Mars is fresh by the European Space Agency is delivering us very accurate and precise pictures of the surface of Mars like this one. You see two craters here. To give you a scale, these are three or four kilometers in diameter. So you have a huge canyon recorded on this picture of, uh, taken by Mars Express, showing very clearly the erosion that we had on the surface of Mars in the past. See, Mars is basically a desert, except you have polar caps with uh, frozen carbon dioxide and also some uh, water ice but the rest is essentially a desert, but it was not always a desert. We know that in the fact that there was flowing water on the surface of Mars. And we would like to understand more about the past of Mars. That's why there's a lot of interest in the study of Mars. And uh, also, further away objects like uh, Saturn are being studied in detail by uh, planetary probes like the Cassini Huygens uh, spacecraft. Cassini landed already on, excuse me, Huygens landed on the surface of a 
uh, Python, one of HTTP's satellites of uh, uh, Saturn. But Cassini is still on orbit around the ring planet and is recording a lot of interesting data about the planet itself. Here you see the shadow of the rings on the surface of Saturn and uh, about its rings and about its satellites. Human spaceflight will take us one day beyond the moon to the surface of Mars. So NASA has a firm intention of doing that around 2030, maybe even later than that, but certainly before the middle of the century we'll have a man set foot on the red planet. Uh, probably an international crew, possibly involving Indians. I know that by that time Indian will have developed its own autonomous means of sending people into space. And there's no reason to believe that they will not cooperate in future bold space adventures like this one. Mm -hmm. Space to learn and space to dream, I think I've demonstrated on this uh, presentation that you have these two aspects. It's, uh, it's a medium that allows us to gain a lot of knowledge about the universe, about the sun, about this, uh, the environment of the earth, and about, uh, about ourselves in biological processes. But it's also uh, a world of dreams. And I would like to show this picture. Uh, India has always been part of uh, human space adventure, and of course it's developing, as I mentioned, its own means of going to space, uh, a capsule. Uh, that should be operated from the middle of the next uh, decade on. But you had um, Rakesh Sharma, who was the first uh, Indian astronaut who flew on board a Russian spacecraft, the first Indian in space, and you had the late uh, Kalpana Shabla, a very, very, very remarkable and respected astronaut. Uh, of, uh, she was representing NASA, of course, as a US citizen, but obviously came from India. And, uh, very, 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 very respected here in India and also over there in the United States for her good work. And uh, she had very unfortunately lost her life in the return of Columbia in 2003. Um, we miss Kalpana, I can tell you. And Sunita is also of Indian origin, also representing NASA, and still is an active astronaut and the flew in the space station for six months in Kepler Earth. And, uh, and I have full respect, admiration, and memories of these very remarkable Indian astronauts. Now, the last thing that I would like to show you is a, a project that we are undertaking and finally with the Indian cooperation in the sense that we have a pseudo satellite called SISQ, a very small satellite uh, that has been designed and built over the last uh, three years by a group of uh, students of ECFL, Ecole Polytechnique de de Lausanne, uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne. And it will be launched in a few weeks from now uh, using a PSLV for the Indian launch site. So this is a form of cooperation between uh, India and uh, Switzerland. And there will be more such cooperation in the future, I'm not too sure. Not only uh, in providing a launch means by India to launch uh, Swiss field satellites, but uh, designing and building future such satellites with groups of students. Uh, Indian and uh, Swiss working together. There's another aspect of uh, uh, work being done at EPFL about the uh, space project uh, where students are involved. It's related to a, a small spaceship that will take uh, tourists, probably, but also possibly scientific experiments, uh, just to the threshold of space on a suborbital uh, trajectory up to 100 kilometers altitude. And I got to show you the kind of trajectory that we're expecting for the spacecraft. You see, the idea is to have uh, the spaceship carried with a carrier aircraft to about 15 kilometers altitude, then you fire the, the rocket. It goes up to about 100 kilometers altitude, pushes over the uh, Mediterranean Sea, which is the south coast of France. Then it comes down, and during about five minutes in that uh, period here, you are going to have weight assist in the, in the spaceship. Then it comes down, it uh, does a recovery maneuver with about 2 G, and we glide down for a landing in east, close to Marseille, in the south of France. So this is another branch of a human spaceflight which will allow non-astronauts to get into space, but for a relatively short uh, period of time. And EPFL has been involved in the design uh, of the spacecraft, and also in uh, the operational aspect of the spacecraft. And uh, we also have a solar impact project that I'm involved in. I think the is also engaged in that project. The idea being to go around the world on solar power only on an airplane with one pilot. 
as a prototype is fully built in good enough uh, air force base near Zurich, and we should try that airplane for the first time at the end of this year. And uh, all of these relatively advanced technological projects, whether it's a uh, CubeSat or whether it's a uh, uh, spaceship taking uh, passengers uh, to the threshold of space or trying to go around the world on solar power rolling, uh, our project where a lot of students are involved and there is no reason to believe that in the future we do not have Swiss and Indian students working on such projects together. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, space debris or space junk is a matter of great concern. Can you please explain briefly about uh, Kessler syndrome? Oh, space debris, okay. Space debris. Space space junk. Junk. You're using the word junk. Yeah. Okay. Space it's a matter of great concern. Okay. Um, there's a lot, quite a lot of space debris, too. Most of it, fortunately, is very, very small. And that does not produce any, any danger for the spaceship or even for spacewalking astronauts. You have also big objects that um, are tracked by radar, and it's always possible to avoid them. You can predict that in a few days or in a few hours, you are going to be coming pretty close to an object, uh, uncomfortably close to an object. Maybe not a collision, but too close for you to be comfortable with. And in that case, the, the ground, which is predicting this uh, close approach on the basis of a radar measurement of the trajectories, and calculation of the predicted trajectory in two hours uh, can uh, give you guidance about the maneuver to perform in order to increase that distance. And uh, we do this quite often on the shuttle. Per, per mission, we have one or two occasions where we need to change a little bit of trajectory using very little fuel in order to come a little further away from objects which are going to come uh, according to the prediction pretty close to us. And then there are the objects in between, which are bigger than the very small ones I was talking about before, but uh, smaller than the ones that are tracked by radar, like a finger in metal, is not tracked by radar, and if it gets to you with 10 kilometers per second, it could be fatal to you as a spacewalker, or it could be doing a lot of damage to the International Space Station or the, or the shuttle. And these are the dangerous objects, and it's not possible to predict whether there will be a collision on a given mission or not, you can only talk about probability. You can say that the probability of a one over a million that you're going to have a hit, that uh, you are not going to survive. Um, I remember some, um, some estimates, for instance, on the last servicing mission of Hubble that I talked about. Um, uh, this mission was in May of this year. And it was considered that there was a one over about 400 probability that there would be a fatal hit by a meteorite uh, on the space shuttle that would make it uh, would be unsurvivable by the crew. So it's not very likely that it happens, but it's not only totally unlikely. And uh, on every mission we take a certain risk. It's true. Uh, space debris is a problem. It will continue to be a problem. The only way that we can reduce the problem is uh, by not producing any more space debris and uh, let the space debris that are there now fall down on the Earth because they all have a limited lifetime. There's some friction still in the atmosphere, three, four, five hundred kilometers altitude. So every one of these objects has a limited lifetime in its orbit and they will fall down eventually. So if we stop producing space debris, we're going to be okay in 50 years from now, 100 years from now. But over the next few years, we're going to have too much debris to be really comfortable. Mm -hmm. But so far, we have had never a fatal accident with a space debris, and uh, we've been in space since 1961. So it means that the likelihood is not so, so, so high. It is certainly non zero. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, so when a spaceship is rising towards the space, <laughs> Does the Earth's rotation has any effect on its trajectory or the direction of launch? Okay, the answer is no. Whether the Earth is rotating or not has no influence on its gravitational field. Uh, the only thing uh, where Earth rotation has an effect, Earth rotation produces a certain flattening of the, uh, of the Earth. So it's not a perfectly uh, stable object. And um, uh, it means that for any orbit that is not a polar orbit or equatorial orbit, you are going to have uh, not completely central force. 
uh, and uh, you have going to have a precession of the orbit because of that not completely centered form. So the orbit, I mentioned orbit being pretty much stable in inertial space. It's the case for equatorial orbit and polar orbit. For, but for any inclination other than 0 degrees or 90 degrees, you're going to have a slow precession, which you can calculate. It's typically for the orbit, the circuit orbit of the space shuttle, let's say 20 kilometers altitude, let's say 40 degrees inclination. It's typically a few degrees per day of Earth precession. So the Earth rotation uh, in itself does not change the gravitational potential of the, of the, of the Earth. Uh, the rotation itself does not, but the rotation produces a change in the shape of the Earth, which has an influence on the precession of the orbit. Sir, my question is that uh, comets are seen after a span of 13 years, but how can we prove that the same comets are seen? Um, um, well, as far as I know, Harry's comet is coming every 76 years. Yeah, 76 years. Um, and the last uh, visit was in the 90s. I don't know exactly when it was, but it was uh, about in the 90s. And, uh, you know, Harry's comet is being tracked, maybe not all the time, but uh, every time it comes close to the sun, it's being tracked. And uh, we can determine its, uh, its orbit. Of course, if it comes close to uh, any of massive objects in the solar system, like uh, Jupiter and Saturn, or your and Neptune, which are quite a massive object. We can predict also any deviation from the uh, elliptical orbit, very eccentric elliptical orbit. But um, you know, we expect it to come back every 76 years or, 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 or so, except if we have these passes close to big planets, because we can predict that also. And this is typically the kind of calculation that we're able to make. Um, and uh, I've, I've not really followed closely what happened with the uh, uh, Halley's Comet orbit since its last uh, pass close to the Earth a few years ago, when it was recorded, by the way, by uh, the Giotto spacecraft of the European Space Agency, which took pictures of the nucleus of the comet Halley. Uh, but this is the kind of calculation we can make very precisely. And uh, to my knowledge, there will be no uh, severe deviation from the 76 year period of the comet Halley's orbit. <laughs> My is K. Vatakarji, I am the final year of medical guy. I want to know what type of physiological experiment already done by NASA in the space. Uh, medical experiment? Medical experiment. Um, well, uh, the, the main problem that we have for long duration space flight is that you have a deconditioning of the muscle and you have a, a reduction in the bone mass. And uh, these are two major problems. There is another one if you go outside of the low Earth orbit, uh, it's uh, the radiation effect. And um, for missions beyond the direct vicinity of the Earth, uh, the radiation effect is probably the, the biggest problem that we have. If we want to have manned mission to Mars, for instance, uh, it takes about three years total, including the trip to go there, uh, the waiting time on Mars until they have the right condition to come back, and then the eight months to come back is about three years total. And the biggest problem is really the, the tracks of radiation that you are going to have either coming from the sun or coming from the, from the, from the galaxy, the galactic plastic ray. And uh, uh, of course, as long as we have low Earth orbit, this is not a problem of radiation, or it's a minor problem, but the major problem is really the, the deconditioning of the bones and the muscles. And uh, countermeasures have been designed over the years so that uh, astronauts on board the NASA space station do a lot of exercise, about two hours per day, so that uh, they reduce significantly the big deconditioning. And now you have astronauts coming back from a long duration flight, typically six months, and they are able to walk shortly after their landing, whether it's with Soyuz or with the space shuttle. And this uh, has been the result of uh, experimenting in the area of. Uh, um, a physical exercise in order to have the best possible protocol of exercise to reduce uh, this deconditioning. Uh, this is about human physiology. Uh, there are some experiments that are made also about the behavior of uh, um, living beings, typically cells and so on in the space environment, exposed, for instance, to the cosmic rays or exposed to the ultraviolet radiation and to the vaccines. Uh, so this is more in the area of biology uh, to see how 
uh, life can sustain the space environment, which again is uh, characterized by the absence of gravity, uh, and at least in the vicinity of the sun by radiation in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, uh, and also the, the cosmic ray particles coming from the sun and the, and the rest of the universe. So, physiological studies and biological studies are done in, in, in parallel. But in terms of physiology, the, the, the main result is really a good protocol for exercising for the long duration uh, space flight so that astronauts come back in pretty good shape, which is not the case 20 years ago. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. you were not only an astronaut, but you were a person of physics. Uh, as far as I know, many of the astronauts are not the people from the field of physics. So, do you have any knowledge about this that any experiment was performed in all these flights which, which tested the theory of physics? For example, now we have this unified field theory. So, is there any experiment which was performed in the past or is there any experiment in the pipeline? Which will prove this, uh, which will test the unified field theory? Uh, well, not use the telescope, but the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you, you are gathering data that are very present in astrophysics in particular. Uh, but this particular field that we are talking about, uh, I'm not aware that there is any uh, space experiment that is going to analyze it. Um, there will be um, an experiment that will be launched at the end of next year, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, uh, that will be taken on, I think, the very last satellite, STS 137 or so. And um, this is going to be uh, looking into interaction of the neutrino particles and the other particles, uh, which is going to be uh, itself an experiment in physics that I don't know the details of, but that's certainly one area of physics that will be analyzed by, by uh, this experiment, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. Sir, Hubble Telescope, as far as I know, is an optical telescope. Yes, is there any other radio telescope being uh, launched in the No, space? there's no plan to launch a radio telescope. In fact, the idea about radio astronomy is to go once on the other side of the moon in order to shield it against all of the radio noise that you have. Uh, on the Earth itself, or on the Moon, on the visible portion of the Moon. Uh, that's probably the best possible utilization of uh, the Moon as a scientific station in the future, is to install a radio telescope on the far side of the Moon, which would be totally shielded from the, the, the radio noise you have on the Earth, or on any part of the vicinity of the Earth which goes directly to the, uh, to the Earth itself. And the far side of the Moon is by definition not exposed to the Earth and its radiation noise. So, uh, studies going back to the moon would have two purposes. On one hand, understand the moon better from a scientific point of view, and use also the moon as a natural space station with certain properties, typically the shielding of the moon itself. Uh, or if you go on the other side, you have shielding of all the, the noise of the radiation coming from the Earth, so which would give you a very, very quiet environment on the other side. So that would be using the moon uh, as a way to do science from the moon. So they've already the science about the moon, the science from the moon, radio telescope on the far side is definitely a good science from the moon. Thank you, sir. Um, sir, I would like to know what black holes are. What black holes are? Okay. <laughs> well, black holes are a very, very, very dense concentration of matter uh, that are so massive and so dense that uh, nothing can escape from them, uh, including light cannot escape from them. As we know, with German theory of relativity, the light rays are bent by large masses. And you can imagine a threshold of mass beyond which light cannot even escape from these objects because the light can be bent back into the, the, the black hole itself. And there's a whole theory of black holes that I'm not really a, an expert on, but uh, uh, black holes seem to have been observed uh, with a very high level of probability in the center of a number of galaxies, including our own galaxy. Uh, obviously, the center of each galaxy is, is a singularity, and this singularity is uh, characterized by very high mass. And uh, in many galaxies, this high mass is uh, in the range of black holes. Uh, so, in the center of the galaxy, you have these very massive objects that you can only detect on the basis of the radiation which is attracted by the black hole itself, 
And being accelerated, it's going to emit radiation, which you can observe. And we observe that in the center of our galaxy and in the center of many other galaxies also. Now it's been magical, it's been exhilarating, and uh, it's been electric. And on behalf of all, those who see here, I really thank you from the core of the heart. And Calgary City thanks you for making a video. Thank you so much.